Hey y'all, and welcome back to Coding with Minmer. On today's agenda, we're going to tackle Leco Problem 133, Clone Graph. After that, we'll go over an actual variant of the original question that Meta asks. From what I've seen, the variant pretty much replaces the OG question, so let's make sure we're ready for it. Alright, let's read the problem statement. We're given a reference to any node in a connected, undirected graph. Our task can be defined in one sentence, return a deep copy of the graph. And although the problem description is short and sweet, just like me, I do need to expound on some very important terminology. First up, what's a connected graph? Well, it's a graph whose nodes are all connected. That from any given node, there exists a path to traverse to all the other nodes. And if I remove, say, this edge right here, then from node 1, I can still reach the other nodes 3 and then 2. I can say the same about node 2 and node 3. That put another way, a connected graph is not a disconnected graph, such as this one. It's not like we'd be given such a graph for the variant. That'd be weird and odd. The second concept is an undirected graph, whereby each node has a two-way edge to all of its neighbors. Take node 2, it has an edge to node 3, and inversely, node 3 has an edge right back to node 2. To verify this relationship, you can check out the schema of a node. It indeed has a list of all of its neighbors. That wraps up the technical terms. What was our task again? In short, given a reference to an input node, it could be any one of these, but we'll go with node 1. We need to create the corresponding new nodes. So at node 1, we'd create new node 1. When we get to node 2, we'll create new node 2 as appropriate. And lastly, when we traverse the node 3, we'd similarly create new node 3. Also, don't forget to create the undirected edges as well. The last thing we do is return the mapped new node from the old given node. This is our answer. This is what we return. As you can imagine, I'll be referring to the input graphs nodes as old nodes and the deep copied ones as the new nodes. It'll make it much easier to distinguish the two. That said, all this begs one question. How do we solve this question within the confines of programming rules and logic? As per usual with trees and graph problems, we shall use the depth first search algorithm. We're feeling risky and frisky, so let's just dispatch a DFS function and try to intuitively solve this as we go, rewinding to earlier parts of our thought process when we need to. Alright, like I said, let's run a DFS function on the given old node, node 1. As we do this, we'll track our stack frames just so we don't lose our spot in the recursion. So on the first iteration, we have a reference to old node 1. Let's take a quick note of that. Our first question is, what do we do on any given node? Well, one thing's for certain, we'll instantiate its new node with the same integer value. Our new node is a dangling reference in midair, but we'll worry about it later. Next, we'll recurse to all of old one's neighbors, 2 and 3. It doesn't matter which one we go to first, but sure, let's go to old node 2. Let's keep track of our path from 1, 2, 2. Where, on old node 2, we'll create the corresponding new node of the 2. After that, we'll repeat our logic to iterate over all of old node 2's neighbors and recurse. Let's go to node 3, where here, same old, same old, we'll spin up a new node with an integer value of 3. Moving on from node 3, we've yet to visit any neighboring nodes, so let's go to node 1. But hold on, though we can technically recurse to old node 1, we shouldn't make a new node 1 multiple times, right? Not only that, this exposes a bigger problem where we could have an infinite loop, where on old node 1, we'd go back to node 3, back to node 1, and then to node 3 until the end of time. The interviewer doesn't have all the time in the world. They most likely have time-consuming unproductive meetings to attend. Therefore, a classic solution for this problem is to use a visited set data structure, where on any given old node, such as old node 1, will not only create its new respective node, but will also insert the old node into our set here. Extrapolating this, by the time we get to our current iteration of old node 3, here's proof, 
we would have also added old nodes two and then the three. Okay, back to where we were on old node three, we're now more prepared. We recurse, remember, to old node one, where we'll look up its key in our set here. We observe it's already in there, which means we've already visited it. No need to do it again. Therefore, we'll return back to old node three. Let's note down that we try to go to node one. Okay, back here. We'll also try going to its other neighbor, node two. Let's jot that down as well. Here we also realize it's already been visited by the virtue of being in our hash set. So we'll return back as well. As you can see, we've exhausted every neighbor of old node three. So we backtrack to node two, where we still have to iterate to neighboring node one. At node one, thankfully we've already processed it, as you can see here. So we'll go back. Great, now we know that we've exhausted all of node 2's neighbors as seen here. So we backtrack to node one, where we'll try going to old node three, which we quickly realize we already processed it. We go back and we're done. Or are we? Recall that we have three awkwardly unreferenced dangling new nodes. They're not stored in a designated data structure let alone connected to one another via undirected edges. What's the intuition behind setting these two-way edges? To answer this, let's rewind our stack frames to when we were at old node three, about to traverse to old node one. Recall that we freshly re-traverse to old node one, where here we look it up in our set data structure that we already visited it. Let's therefore execute the return statement. But wait one second, when I say return, we didn't actually return anything, right? Thus, it's as if our recursive function had a void return type. But don't we see an opportunity here? That if we somehow had a mapping from old node three to new node three, as well as old node one to new node one, then don't we have all the references we need to create this edge? More specifically at old node one, we look up its corresponding node and return that. On the backtrack, we have a reference to old node three. So if we look up its mapped node here, then we have the two nodes we need to set an edge between them. Specifically, from new node three to its return type of new node one. Of course, to accomplish this, we need some manifestation of a mapping from old to new. It's not too far fetched to suggest a map data structure. What we can do is abandon our set here and rather opt for a map. That on any given node, yes, will create its corresponding new node, but right after that, we'll insert a mapping from old to new into our map. We'll do the same thing when we traverse to old node two and then old node three. Let's track those. Sweet. With this in mind, let's continue this DFS example. All right, where were we? We're on node three. We've gone to node one, but not yet node two. So let's do so. We recurse to old node two. Let's check if it's been processed or not, but hold on, we no longer have our set. We have a map to which I say, who cares? Both are hash data structures. Our map here can serve a dual purpose in life. It can maintain the old to new mappings, but also act as the visited data structure. We can still look up old node two as a key and observe that it's already been visited. For proof, check our recursive stacks here. Since old node two has already been processed, we can look up new node two to get a reference here and immediately return that to old node three. Here, we'll do something similar. We'll look it up in our map to access new node three, which by the way is a reference here. And with these two references, there's nothing stopping us from setting new node two as a neighbor of new node three. This is great and all, but we can't help but notice that we've only set edges one way, not the other way around. Don't be sad though, we'll handle it shortly. Okay, so we traverse to all of old node three's neighbors. Because we did this, we can simply backtrack to where we came from and return. 
I hope you caught that. It was our word of the day, return. Our function return type returns a node now, right? Not void. Why not look up old node 3 in our map here to access new node 3 and return that. At old node 2, we're repeating our existing logic at this point. We'll look it up as well. Reference new node 2, which is right here. And just like that, we have the two references we need to set the other edge from 2 to 3. That wraps up all the programming logic, where in summary, on the backtrack from a single neighbor, we'll set an edge going one way, and then on the backtrack from all neighbors, we'll set an edge going the other way. Sounds good, let's go through the rest of this example. We're back at old node 2. Remember, we already went to node 3, so let's go to old node 1. The only other neighbor. Where here, we'll do a lookup in our map, and since it's in our data structure, it's been visited. Therefore, we'll access the corresponding new node one, which refers to this node, and return that. Back at old node two, we'll look up new node two and set the edge between the two. Amazing, we've now exhausted all of node two's neighbors, one and three. So we'll look it up in our map to find new node two and return that for old node one. And because of this, we can set the edge the other way around. Okay, continuing on at old node one, we've traversed to two, but not yet three, so let's do that. At old node three, we encounter our only base case, it's already been visited. We don't want an infinite loop in our lives, so we'll look up the mapped new node three and return that to old node one. On the backtrack here, we can use our map to look up this new node, and since we have these two references, we'll set an edge from one, two, three. Amazing, we've visited all of old node one's neighbors, so according to our algorithm, we can look up our old node of one in our hash map here to reference new node one, which visually is right here, and return that to the caller function. This is our answer, this is what we return. Recall the problem description requires us to return the new node of the input node. It all works out. The time complexity in regards to graphs is usually in terms of nodes and edges. So it'll come out to n plus e, where n is the number of nodes and e is the number of edges. The space complexity is also big O n, where n is the number of nodes in our hash map. Before we get into the code, note there's one nuisance of an edge case. We can technically be given a null pointer as input. In this case, we'll just return a null pointer, and that's about it. Thanks for that, leak code. Let's take care of that annoying edge case, where if we're given a null pointer, we'll return a null pointer right back. Let's dispatch our DFS, but not without our trusty hash map that maps the old node to the new node. Let's be consistent, let's call it old to new. Okay, let's call our DFS function and pass in the input old node as well as our map. And we'll actually return it too, since remember, it'll conveniently return for us the new mapped node. Let's define our helper DFS function. Again, it'll take in the old node and our map. What's our base case? Well, if we look up the old node, and it does exist in our hash map as a key, then it's already been visited. Let's return the corresponding new node. This is useful for us on the backtrack. Otherwise, if this is the first time we've traversed an old node, we'll create the corresponding new node and insert the two as a key value pair mapping in our hash data structure. After this, we'll loop through all of the neighbors like so. We'll recurse to each neighbor, pass in the same map, and on the backtrack of this call, it'll return the new node. Therefore, we'll look up the new node of our current old node, get access to its neighbors, and set an edge between the two. One last piece of logic, when we backtrack from all neighbors, we can take advantage of this opportunity to set the other edge in the undirected relationship. We'll return the respective new node as the return type, very cool, that's the implementation. A bit confusing to explain in code, but a lot easier to digest with diagrams. Let's look at the variant.
The variance is very tricky because Meta will present the input parameters very ambiguously. As it turns out, they're giving you a reference to a disconnected undirected graph. Like before, we want to return a deep copy of that graph, specifically of this graph type. This has many implications on the class schema. So let's walk through it with a visual diagram. Okay, here's our example. Notice it's um, disconnectivity and fragmented characteristic. We're given an object of type graph that has one field, a list of all of the roots. Like the OG, the root reference could be any node in their respective graph. For example's sake, let's say this is a root and node 5 is a root. Luckily though, our node class here remains the same and has the same undirected edge relationship between any two nodes. As to how we solve this, we can break this problem into subtasks, in which each subtask is the original Lico problem. Before, we were only given one graph, right? But now, we can potentially have multiple graphs. Why not reuse our DFS function call from the previous problem and simply run a for loop over these roots? Once for node 2, for this graph, and another time for node 5, for this other graph. Please be aware of a similar edge case, we can still be given a null pointer as a root node. In these cases, we'll just skip it and continue in our for loop to the next root. I'll spare you the redundant walkthrough of each DFS call, so I'll just tell you what will happen. The first thing we'll do is initialize a resulting graph type as our answer. And to build it, we'll loop over each root node of our input. Okay, so on the first iteration, do we have a null pointer? No, we don't. So we're in the clear to dispatch a DFS call to traverse this whole graph and create new nodes of the old nodes, two, one, three. Thankfully, we handled building the undirected edges as well. When our DFS is finished, it'll return new node two, which will push to our new roots. On our next iteration, do we have a null pointer? Actually, this time we do. So let's just skip this iteration and move on. On the last iteration, we have old node 5. So let's run our exact DFS function that we implemented before, creating nodes 5 and then thereafter 4. The node that's ultimately returned is new node 5. So let's push that into our new roots. We're now done with our loop. This is our answer. This is what we return. In retrospect, all we did was write a wrapper function to encapsulate our core recursive functionality. The time complexity is still big of n plus e, where n is the total number of nodes across all of our graphs, and e is the total number of edges across all of the graphs. The space complexity is also the same at big O n, where n is the total number of nodes in our hash maps, one for each graph. The code is thankfully terse, so let's do it real quick. All right, so check out our new inputs and outputs. It's a disconnected graph now. We'll firstly want to instantiate our output graph, let's call it output, and then we'll return it before I forget. We'll wrap our DFS function with a for loop over all of the input root nodes. For each iteration, we'll reuse our logic, so let's move it as appropriate. Now, on the return, we get back a new root node, so let's add it into our output graph. Let's access all the new roots and push it back. Now, there's this one last thing. Recall I briefly mentioned that if a given root node is null, we'll simply continue on to the next iteration. Okay, one last last thing. I am aware you can reuse the same map and simply clear it on each iteration, but I'll just choose not to for simplicity. Overall, this question trips up a lot of candidates and I can totally understand why. If you can cut through the ambiguity, you'll be golden. That's all I have for you, so I wish you luck on your interviews.